Welcome back to the Sports Not interview today. The subject, of course, what else? The Final Four. Yes, it's like Christmas morning for me. Yeah, the tournament coming to its uh, end and in an exciting way. And we to talk about the tournament today, we have Justin Williams, who writes college basketball for The Athletic. Justin, thanks for being with us today about Sports Not. Absolutely appreciate you guys having me. All right, so let's jump into this. I mean, you look at the path uh, of all of these teams to get to the Final Four. Always great stories in this tournament, which is why I love it so much. You have UConn, of course, defending champions, looking to be the first to go back-to-back -back since 2006 and seven when, uh, when Florida did it. Then you have NC State uh, on their first run, first Final Four since 1983. Purdue, of course, knocked out last year in such an upsetting manner. They're finally where they should be, as many people would expect. And then Alabama surprising people to get to the Final Four. Talk a little bit about just these four teams, this Final Four, and, and why it's such a great story. Yeah, I mean, for people that have been following college basketball all season, you know, it's not surprising for UConn and Purdue to be here. Doesn't mean it's it's not impressive. They've obviously done, you know, played really well. Um, UConn, especially that that thirty nothing run against a really good Illinois team is <laughs> that's that's wild and probably like gets undervalued for how impressive that is. But as much as you know, especially people like us, we don't want to go chalk when we're picking our bracket, like. It's hard to look at it and feel like UConn, Purdue, one of those two weren't going to be here. It's not surprising that that both of them are. But even within that, you mentioned there's good stories. Like going back to back is hard. UConn has a really good chance to do that. I was in Columbus last year when Purdue lost to, to Fairleigh Dickinson. And mm. so I understand how that sticks with people, seeing them lose to a 16 seed and for them to kind of, you know, revamp uh, a little bit of their approach and for ED to get better, I, I think is really impressive. You know, Alabama to me is like the, uh, I wrote about this this week, it's like the archetype of the modern college basketball, how the sport has changed. It's a bunch of transfers. Nobody on that team has been on the roster for more than two years, like even down to the walk-ons. Um, they shoot a bunch of threes. They play like, as you know, at a breakneck speed as fast as possible. And whether it's going to work, you know, I, I don't know, but it, it's gotten them this far, which is impressive. <laughs> and so I think, you know, when you go out there, when, when coaches get hired and they talk about, oh, we're going to go to the transfer portal and play fast like there's actually now an example of you can do that and get to the final four because nato has done it with bama and then yeah nc state just like i don't know it feels like the clock's gonna strike midnight on them you know here <laughs> sooner rather than later but what an unbelievable run uh you know I, I wrote about i think they were down like 12 to louisville in the first round of the acc tournament three weeks ago and just Crazy. seemed like all right they're done is kevin keats gonna get fired you know that you know what's gonna happen with this team moving forward and they go from that point to now they're in the final four ripping off nine straight wins they have dj burns dj horn just these these great stories so you know and then obviously the 83 connection with valvano and all that kind of stuff i, I don't know that they're gonna make it to the championship game and you know they have a chance to kind of get run in, in this final four team with with how good um you know these teams have been playing but mm -hmm. just a ton of credit for 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 how well that they've uh they've they played this run here the past couple of weeks yeah i mean i think i think for for those of us who have alma maters that are no longer in the tournament and i i went to unlv so it's been a long time since we've been relevant but you talk about the transfer portal and how that's changed the game when back when i was in school and we were good at unlv it was because we were taking transfer we were taking junior college transfers so schools used to do that and these people used to decry oh that's a bad way to do it you can't win you can't do it now you're starting to see the landscape change and i know we'll all get used to it eventually uh because we love the sport right but you look at the matchups in particular let's start with north carolina state you have that big man matchup right with Edie and burns now down low and uh it to me it's going to be a fascinating uh i think lesson in how you defend burns because nobody's been able to do it that little quick spin move he's got under the basket a man that big i don't think should be able to make a move that way but he does he's able to do it he's so freaking quick when you look at that matchup uh is that one of the exciting things about this this game at the first game of the final four Oh, definitely. I mean, it's also just kind of interesting. There's been a little bit of a throwback in this tournament with with post play. Like, yeah. you know, it's not like the way Purdue plays is the old school Wilt Chamberlain throw it in. But, you know, Clemson made it to the Elite Eight with, you know, kind of a, a heavy post presence. Obviously, Purdue plays that way. Mm -hmm. uh, North Carolina State plays that way with with, um, with Burns. And, it, you know, I think the thing that makes Burns work is DR, right? Like he's a good kind of compliment to him in the post, having, you know, a little bit more of a, a rim attacking type 
presence to kind of play off of him. So yeah, I, I'm very curious to see how it goes. We have not seen anyone find a way to kind of bottle up Edie um, really all season. Um, so I assume Diara will probably guard him more on the defensive mm. end but i'm curious to see what that how they kind of uh, approach that um and then you're right you know can can burns maybe get a couple early fouls on ed or, or just be a little bit of a different player than than they're used to and can that throw them off i would be shocked if you know nc state kind of comes out and punches them in the mouth and, and gets a lead but i you know i'm shocked that nc state made it this far so i'm yes. not going to rule it out yeah and, and and that one thing i look at this game Justin, and I, I look at NC State, despite the great run, they play a seven-man rotation. You have Purdue on the other side pretty deep. How is that going to play into this game, uh, especially around the fact that, I mean, look, Purdue's good all the way through, uh, and they, they can go nine guys, ten guys deep. When you look at that, is that going to be the biggest challenge for North Carolina State? Yeah, and I think you see that with Purdue sometimes. They have a tendency, less so this year than last year, like to start slow a little bit or, or you mm. know, kind of teams hang around. I think even wh- whoever they played in the, the first round was it Grambling. I, I can't even remember. Like, you know, people were saying, oh, this team's hanging around a little bit through the first eight minutes. And then, you know, Purdue just wears you down through going to ED over and over again, having some of those guys, Braden Smith kind of on the outside helping helping chip in. But you're right. They they just have so much depth and they kind of keep, you know, keep coming after you. So uh, they Maybe the the more likely scenario here is that NC State you know hangs with them for the you know the first few minutes and we get to the under twelve under eight timeout in the first half and people are like you know oh NC State's hanging tough and then by the time you get to halftime or that first media timeout after the break Purdue starts to pull away because it feels like we've seen them do that it's definitely in this tournament but really all season yeah and I look at Purdue too if they get hot from the outside I think that's that's going to be really tough for North Carolina State now if they can somehow stymie them on the outside from three then I think they can keep the game a little bit closer now we switch to Alabama and UConn talk about how good is this UConn run this past two years how good is this team when you look at the last five ten years of college basketball just how good are they Justin in your mind yeah, I mean, they have a chance, like you said, to do something that hasn't been done since Florida, but also just the way they play. I mean, I don't want to under, uh, undersell their defense because their defense is really good, and I think that could be kind of what differentiates them with an Alabama team that has a great offense. But the stuff that you know UConn runs offensively, like, I mean, it is for kind of like the hoop head X's nose basketball fans, <laughs> it's ridiculous. And, you know, they, they have they can beat you in so many ways. I talked about kind of the – yeah. modern archetype that Alabama has been. I, I love the way UConn has has built their roster. They have some transfers and, you know, guys like Cam Spencer. Um, they have these, um, you know, kind of homegrown guys, Donovan Klingon. Um, and then they have Stephen Castle, who's going to be a lottery pick, who's like their fourth or fifth option. They did this with Hawkins last year. Danny Hurley has mastered the role player lottery mm. pick in a way that no one has where it's like here's a great guy that nba teams are salivating over and yet you know if he scores six points this game it does it doesn't matter we're still gonna win you know by by 25 uh you know illinois i believe going into that that game illinois was the number one ken palm offense and uconn went on a 30 to nothing run against them like that is unbelievable. There are not Dominic. many teams that, you know, in recent history that could could do that. And so to me, that that little stretch there, like a long stretch, I think somebody said it was like 50 minutes of real time that, you know, across halftime, Illinois didn't score a basket. That right there is like, this is why this UConn team is so good. Because when they can kind of get rolling, they can do it on both ends. They have so many options. They have guard play. They have post play. Uh, they have athleticism. They have shooting. And so as good as I think – Alabama is and as much as I love watching Alabama play because of the pace and I think Mark Sears is awesome I think Purdue has a chance to to beat UConn if it gets to that point but Mm -hmm. I just have a hard time seeing you know Alabama is going to have to shoot out of its mind from three-point range and UConn's going to have to go a little bit cold I think for for them to have a chance yeah that was going to be my next question to you because I remember the Clemson game they hit 16 three-pointers Right. So, I mean, you're, you're kind of living, living and dying by that three point shot. So and, and you're tired. Ta- you talk about the pace and that's what that's why Alabama is fun to watch. But then you go up against a team with UConn that's so deep, that's so fundamentally sound in each facet of the game. Look, anything can happen. We all know that. That's why they play the games. But man, it, it, to me, it looks like the X factor for Alabama has to be that three point shot. And they got to come out and start doing it quick. 
Yeah, and that and that's what they do. They've done it all year. They come out and they chuck them. They play fast. Uh, but you're right. You know, for a team like Clemson, that's not necessarily what they want to see. UConn's like, fine. If you want to come out and chuck threes and play fast, like, great. We, we can run with that. We can hang with you. Now, again, the equalizer would be if they all go in for Alabama and they don't go in for UConn, then that can kind of maybe shift it a little bit. Um, and it, it's it's possible. You know, we, what, I think Sears hit six or seven in a row or something yeah. like that in, in that Elite Eight game. Um, so it could certainly happen. But it. It's one of those situations where it feels like as good as Alabama is, pretty much everything is going to have to go right for them in order to, to, to have a chance to win. Yeah, so so by this conversation, if we assume, and again, anything can happen, so fans out there of NC State and Alabama, don't get mad at me, but if it's a UConn-Purdue matchup in, 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 the, in the championship game, um, that one, what's what would be the key for Purdue? I mean, look, these are two teams that you expected to be there. But when you look at Purdue and all the strengths we talked about earlier, and then you look at UConn, um, is that going to be is it going to be a battle, or do you think that it's going to be UConn uh, really coming out and just maybe slowly wearing down Purdue, which Purdue does well too, by the way, uh, and and just taking it at the end? Or how do you how do you what do you see in your crystal ball when you look at that championship game if it's those two teams? Yeah, I mean, I would say if it's not those two teams, that means we're going to have an awesome, like, you know, one <laughs> yeah. of those two, two teams is going to pull an upset in the Final Four. It's going to be incredible, which, again, can certainly happen. That's why it's such a fun tournament. Um, if it is UConn and Purdue, yeah, it's it's kind of like, okay, this is, you know, the, the chalkiest outcome, but it's an exciting one because of how well these teams have played all year. It, it does feel like whichever team goes on a run, I don't think it'll be a 30 nothing run the way that, that UConn did, but at some point, you know, in the game, somebody's going to go on a, a 12 0 run or a 15 to two run or something like that. Both of those teams have that capability. It kind of just feels like which of those teams is going to do it to me. Uh, UConn just, they have so many different pieces. Um, you know, Purdue has done a good job of not being like completely dependent on Edie and throwing the ball into the post, but that's still like, that's their game plan. Edie's going to get you, you know, 30 and 12 or the other night, 40 and 16. Um, but are, are they going to have enough of the other pieces to, you know, add to that? You're not going to win many games scoring 40 points. Uh, UConn, <laughs> it feels like has a good enough defense and, and good enough um, flexibility and versatility that they can overcome a really good ED game. Um, and so I would maybe give the edge to them just because of how balanced they are. Mm. But if any, I, I feel like if any team's going to, you know, if, if UConn wins and goes back to back, they're going to earn it because these are two very different teams that they're playing, uh, two really good offensive teams. And mm -hmm. so for them to get through both of these teams as good as UConn is, it would just kind of show, you know, how talented and how incredible this run has been the past couple of years. Yeah. And Dan Hurley has done a great job coaching over the over the over several years. And if you look at uh, that, that's a big challenge for him as a coach to to go from one style to the other and, and really put those two games. But. They're so good, Justin, that I, I, I can see that happening uh, pretty pretty simply. Let me ask you this before we let you go. Um, and I know we're talking about the men's tournament here, but I just want to get your reaction to we saw the ratings for the women's games the other day, the, the, the Iowa versus LSU game. Of course, Caitlin Clark, everybody's uh, favorite sister, daughter. And you look at that. Give me your reaction to I, I mean, the fact that that game drew so many viewers and Caitlin Clark. I mean, listen, amazing player. She is fun to watch. What do you make of that whole change, that shift? We're starting to see women's basketball now, and some of the players there obviously capture the imagination of sports fans, male or female. Yeah, I think as much as the game has has grown, and you know, I know last year was really popular. Uh, it it felt a little bit like a tipping point mm -hmm. that that game, the LSU Iowa game the other night, just because you know. Uh, I've been following covering basketball a year, but for the first time I had people who I, you know, I don't think have tuned into many women's basketball games who were like texting me about whether they, you know, like, Hey, who should I gamble on in this? <laughs> there was something, you know, I think places like the athletic and, and ESPN who have kind of been covering this mm -hmm. sport um, did a really good job of, of marketing it and getting people to know, like, this is a big game and people tuned in. And then the biggest factor to all of that, is Caitlin Clark. Like you, you can get people to tune in and say, Hey, Caitlin Clark's great. Kim Mulkey's, you know, really intense and Angel Reese is great. But for Caitlin Clark, you know, for everyone to hype her up and then, you know, people maybe who have never tuned in before tune in and she, what did she score? 41. 41. And it's just like, you know, bang and step back threes to me, obviously she's incredible. There's nothing I can say that hasn't been said about how good she is, but to basically have this, you know, insane moment, the highest of possible, 
you know, intention and press pressure uh, on this game. And then she absolutely delivers. Like, I think that's going to be such a huge springboard for this game because those 12.3 million people who watched the game got to see like an unbelievable, incredible performance. And then they're going to go into the final four and get to see a great UConn, uh, Iowa game. And then hopefully they'll watch South Carolina and be like, Oh wow. Like this, <laughs> this is actually the best team in, in, in the tournament. Um, so just an incredible performance by Caitlin Clark that I think is, is really going to do a lot for a game that was already growing it felt like that game might take the interest in the sport to another level which is yeah awesome. and the wnba is licking their chops counting the days until the draft so they can get her in the league and i think indiana, indiana's right? got the like, first pick indiana hit the lottery they're like okay let's go can we, can we just do the posters now put her in a uniform you know because they're going to take her anyway but yeah it's going to be fascinating to watch all good for college basketball all the way around men women uh what an exciting year and it's it's good it needed it i think and so we're excited about it here at sports not and i know if you want to keep up with the latest especially Final Four uh, on the men's side, make sure you check out Justin Williams up on The Athletic. Justin, thanks for being with us today, spending so much time. Absolutely appreciate you having me.